Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's get uh, started. Uh, thanks for being patient. There are about a gazillion things to set up here, but I think we are ready now. Um, if you are joining this class for the first time, maybe you missed the first one for some reason, I'll just reintroduce myself. I am Anna Marasovic. I've been a professor uh, here at Utah since 2022. 20, uh, I use she, her pronoun, and I work um, for my research in this space of NLP and large language models. Um, I want to uh, remind you that you all should read the syllabus carefully. You are responsible for understanding everything is, that's written there. If there is anything confusing or potentially not, uh, not consistent, please let us know. Uh, we are happy to clarify things. Um, I want to point just one aspect of the syllabus, which is evaluation. Um, your assignments are, uh, uh, are going to consist I'm going to make up for 40% of your final grade. And the first assignment uh, is release. Uh, this assignment is basically everything uh, about what we are going to talk about uh, today. So after this lecture, you should be ready to uh, go and start working on this assignment. And I um, recommend that you start working early, especially if you haven't taken machine learning or deep learning before. This is also a great way to assess whether the level of coding will be um, appropriate for your current levels um, of uh, coding in Python, which I expect that you know. Um, are there any questions about the assignments now that you maybe have uh, taken a first look? I, I have seen that you maybe tried to solve it, but uh, apologies, I didn't emphasize last time I released the assignment, but uh, I didn't intend that you will be able to immediately figure it out given that today we are gonna learn about perceptron and logistic regression, which is the content of the assignment. Uh, but maybe any something else that caught your attention just by skimming through it. Okay, um, uh, we also have a class website. If you haven't been here before in this website, I link recordings uh, and slides from the lecture and uh, readings. There was a question about how you should engage with the readings. For me, uh, lectures are the main content of this course and I expect you to know what I present during the lectures. Everything outside of these slides are not uh, mandatory for you to know. I'm pointing you to the main readings, which are basically more or less what we cover in the lecture. And I personally like reading after the lecture, having something a little bit more coherent with a better flow. So if you like something like that, that's a, that's a place to go. And then there are some optional readings. This is more if you wanna know even more, um, I might link some cutting edge papers there, something that's totally up to your discretion uh, of whether you wanna engage with that material or not. All the materials are free and you should not purchase any, uh, any materials. I mean, you may if you wish, of course, uh, no one will forbid you to do that, but I do not require you to purchase any materials. Okay, so that's a, all I want to remind you of. Are there any questions about the logistics of the course? Okay, um, then we are gonna go into our uh, first um, more technical uh, lecture. Okay. Today we are gonna talk about how to approach uh, building um, building basically like an application, a software, a program that can um, exhibit some kind of um, language understanding and language use. So one very classical example and that, you know, all teachers of NLP will introduce is sentiment classification, which is a task where you are given some text for example, here we have a full movie review that someone had actually written on IMDb. And the goal is to predict the whether this review is positive or negative. So we call this binary sentiment classification, binary because we have two labels, sentiment because sentiment positive or negative, and classification because we are determining in which, class, uh, in which of these two classes this text belongs to. Um, and today we are going to see how to approach building a sentiment classifier with machine uh, learning. So sentiment classification here is our test bed, but what the goal here today is to go over a little bit of machine learning basics. If you have finished a machine learning course, 
you will know everything that I'm going to talk about uh, today. And you'll probably zone out a little bit. I don't blame you. Beginnings are going to be a little bit slower and a little bit more basics, but already in a couple of weeks, there will be uh, likely new material that you haven't seen in those courses before. So um, the first step when we are building a classifier is our representation. Our input is a string. However, our computers don't like strings. We don't know what, what exactly are we going to do uh, later on if you want to build these computational models that are able to predict whether this is a, a positive or negative movie review. So the first step we need to do is turn this string into uh, some kind of a vector. And we are going to call this vector feature vector. Feature because uh, each one of the values in this vector is a feature that relates to this uh, text and describes it and represents it in some way. Um, I will use notation x for the string and f uh, fix as the feature uh, vector. Uh, our label also needs to be represented numerically. We can't put this emojis or descriptions. So here we're going to uh, use plus one to say this is positive movie review and minus one to say this is a negative movie review. And this is basically our pipeline when we when we are talking about supervised machine uh, learning. Um, here, um, not necessarily supervised, here any kind of machine learning will uh, describe, be des described with this. We have our string. We represent that string with a vector. And then that vector is an input into some function, which I call m here, m for a model. And that function there, its output is going to be a predicted label that I will denote with i hat. So i is going to be gold label, the, the label that a human person has assigned to this movie review when they wrote this movie review. Uh, and i hat will be the predicted label. When we talk about supervised machine learning, we are going to first assume that our true mapping, if it exists, like a mapping of I'm the movie reviews to their actual sentiment labels, uh, belongs to some family of functions. One family of functions are, for example, linear functions or any kind of polynomials. So you make that assumption. You, you decide uh, as a developer Yes, this problem may be modeled by this family of functions. And for simplicity, let's think about just the simplest line, a x plus b. So we make that assumption, but we do not know these coefficients. We call them coefficients, weights, parameters. They all mean the same thing. And I will probably use them interchangeably. Once we start moving to neural networks, I'll probably use word parameters more than anything else. So when we talk about the line, a linear a linear function, then we have two co unknown coefficients here, a and b. A tells us how uh, what's the slope of this line, and b tells us uh, how high or low this line is. And we need to learn it to see how to to model our uh, data. Um, so the problem of supervised machine learning is learning these weights, these coefficients. And we are going to learn that from the some labeled existing uh, existing labeled uh, examples, and we are going to use two uh, splits of the data. One split is going to be called the training data set. That's the data we are going to use to find appropriate coefficient weights parameters a and b. And we are going to approach this as an optimization problem. So if you have taken any kind of uh, numerical analysis courses. You have learned a bunch of those uh, already. You might just not connect this to any kind of like real world uh, uh, objects. So what we are going to do is we are going to start with some uh, initial values for our parameters A and B, and we are going to iteratively change them. And we are going to iteratively change these parameters such that the loss becomes smaller and smaller where our loss is defined as the difference between our predicted values and the actual values. Uh, and you can imagine this, you have like a little kid and you're trying to teach them and you are giving them one example at a time. Initially, they 
whatever they try to do is very different from the, what they should, uh, should do. That's very high loss, but you give some kind of feedback and then um, parameters in their head change and they gradually uh, de decrease the loss by doing this uh, action uh, properly. So all these uh, terms I have emphasized here are important. We make assumptions. We are learning. When we talk about machine learning, it's in the name of the field, learning. So it's an important term. Training data is important. Supervise means that the data is labeled. We have optimization and we have loss functions. Very important term for uh, supervised machine learning. Once we are done, we have finished, we have found what we deem appropriate parameters. We have found that line that we think fits our data really well. And when I say fit, imagine you have some data points and that line or polynomial is exactly over those uh, points or somewhere close to them. Then we are going to do our evaluation. We are going to have a split of uh, data, which we are going to call test set. It's going to be held out, meaning our test set instances are never, never, never used for training. That's like the main principle of machine learning one-on-one. -on -one. You have trained test split and test instances are never used for training or setting up any kind of modeling decisions is completely held out. And the reason why it's important to have this set held out is because of the uh, important uh, concept called generalization. Again, it's highlighted because it's very important. It's a technical term you should know. And generalization, uh, when we say whether a model generalizes, what we actually ask ourselves, does the model adapt properly to new instances we have not seen during the training, uh, but they are drawn from the same distribution as our training uh, instances. Um, let me illustrate this a little bit more. Uh, here in the blue points, you have your data. Um, let me find my laser point. All right. Um, you have your data points and, and in um, blue line, model line, I'm sorry if you don't see uh, colors very well, uh, but the model line is this one here, very close here, and very crazy one is over here. The orange line or polynomial here is uh, a true function that models this underlying problem. When we fit our model well to the data, you will have this kind of situation where your true and modeled uh, polynomials are very close to each other. However, if you overfit on the data, uh, you will do something crazy. You will try to uh, mo properly model every single example in this training data. And because you try to do that, you got this very complex function here. We see this, uh, this very big drops there indicate that this polynomial is very complex. If we decided like here, okay, we are gonna allow a little bit of room for error to be sure that later on we can model other types of data uh, drawn from this distribution. Then we do have a little bit of loss, but we model this distribution better. And underfitting is the case where we have a, a model that's too simple and doesn't fit the data well. And then we have huge errors even on the data we have seen. Caught Catching underfitting is easy because you have your training data, so you're just checking the loss. If your loss is enormous on your training data set, then you know you are underfitting, right? But um, although there are techniques for dealing with um, overfitting, which we'll talk about not today, but later, it is a harder thing to achieve. Generalization um, doesn't come so easily. Uh, but have this in mind that once we are done with our model training, we are going to do the evaluation. We will have our test set instances. We are going to check how accurate our model is on those test set instances. And we are also going to um, have in mind that we want our model to generalize well to these unseen instances. 
And the easiest way to check whether your model is, had overfitted is if your train test set, a training set accuracy is 100%, and then your test set accuracy is 56%. There is a huge, uh, huge drop. And we are going to talk about this a little bit more, but I wanted to uh, bring this uh, up immediately. OK, let's stop for a moment. Are there, there a question about this difference, uh, you know, two key components or stages of supervised machine learning, training, and evaluation? Yes, please. So on the generalization on the resilience slide, um, were you saying that the degree between is also not, is it for a resilience because of that drop? Is that what you were saying? Uh, so here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is. This is not a good way to model this data um, because you see that here uh, you should compare how different your blue and orange lines are. What you should have uh, found, learned, is this something very alike the orange line like we did in this proper case where we have a polynomial of degree four. But here we kind of allowed the model to do whatever it wants. So it decided I'll get zero percent, like zero loss on my training data. Uh, and that was detrimental to its ability to adapt to new instances. Because here, imagine I can now draw a new example from this distribution, which is going to be close to the orange one, because that's where the data come from. And your model will be terrible at it, right? You will have this huge uh, difference if we have this uh, example over here. Oh, yeah. All right, so we'll talk more about generalization, overfitting, underfitting, how to deal with it, cross-validation and stuff like that. I just wanted to briefly mention it. Yeah. Can you go back a slide? Yeah, of course. So there's FO. Does uh, the M function map to one or negative one and then the F of X map to anything? F of X is our feature vector. It doesn't map to anything. Um, I'll talk now about what the feature vector could be, uh, but it is a vector of some kind. Um, and you'll see what it is now. It has certain dimension. And um, Today, we are going to talk about feature vectors where we understand what these dimensions in these vectors are. In about 10 or days or two weeks, I don't know exactly, we'll talk about word embeddings where dimensions of these vectors will not be interpretable. We will not know what those numbers mean exactly. So in that sense, it could be anything. OK, so. Oh, yeah. What do you mean by features? Features. Yeah, so um, I didn't specify what features are yet. I, I think you should think about features, anything that can describe your text or represent it in some way, which is a very vague notion. Now, when we go into describing one type of feature vectors, that's going to be one or zero, for example, whether a certain word was present or not in the your input. Uh, you might have a count, how many times that word had appeared in the uh, input. So I'll talk about this uh, now. Uh, and when we talk about whether a word was not present or whether a word was present or not, then the word itself is what we deem to be feature. Yeah. Can a feature be multiple dimensions? Feature. Um, or vector. One so vector. let's not. Uh, Let's not mix feature vector and the feature. So um, feature vector is um, a vector where the values of in each dimension correspond to a feature. Um, it's like a function of the feature. So let me let me. It it comes next. So I feel like a lot of confusion comes because I didn't describe what a uh, feature vector is. So. Let's go over that and then come back and see whether there were any more uh, specific questions about the feature. Uh, okay, I will then come to stochastic gradient descent in a second. So um, yeah, there are two components of what I have said so far. We are doing, we are trying to produce a feature vector representation of our input text using a vector. And then once we have that vector, we are going to shove it into some function whose parameters we don't know 
and we are trying to learn. And once we learn those parameters, that function will give us uh, the label, uh, positive or negative. So these are what these are the things we are going to talk about today. First, feature vector, then, um, then how to learn this function m, and specific functions we are going to learn are perceptron and logistic regression. So let me go into the feature vector. Uh, first thing we'll need to do before we produce to produce a feature vector is something called tokenization, massively important component of all uh, NLP systems of large language models and therefore of AI today. Tokenization means we are going to split our string into a sequence of tokens. And tokens is another important um, term to remember. Um, it's basically like a unit um, that you decide to split your uh, string into. And today we are gonna have next lecture is going to be all about tokenization. So I don't wanna go too much over that today. And for now, let's uh, think of only one type of tokenizer, which is white space tokenizer, where you split your uh, uh, text with uh, wherever white space occurs, which of course does work for some languages that do not have, uh, do not use uh, white space to um, separate tokens, uh, to separate words, but for English language, it works okay. So focus on English language for now and white space tokenizer. Uh, so for example, he had that uh, sentence in the movie review I have shown you before. The film is interesting as an experiment, but tells no cogent story. What you produce with the white space tokenizer is a list of strings where each one of these strings is an, a word, should be a word in the um, input, but we already see that it doesn't work very well, for example, when we have punctuation. So here, instead of having story, and period separated, we had story period as uh, as a uh, one of these strings. So that's one of the failures. Conjunctions are other failures. For example, isn't uh, written like this will not be split into is and an apostrophe t. Uh, hyphenated phrases we would also like to see split. We would like to see, for example, prize winning to be split into prize hyphen winning. And as I mentioned, punctuation won't work. Here we will have great and movie, uh, we won't have great movie and then exclamation point as a separate uh, thing. So it's not really great. It's not really, as I said, good for certain languages. It's not great for languages that are morphologically rich, meaning they have a lots of suffixes or prefixes. Things we're gonna talk about next time for now, Important to know is that tokenization means that we split the string into a sequence of tokens um, and uh, that imagine white space tokenizer for everything we'll talk about uh, next. There are some other pre-processing steps we could do, or this also comes under the name of text normalization. For example, you can do lemmatization, which means that we need to determine whether two words have the same root despite their surface differences. For example, that sang, song, sings are all forms of sing. Um, and therefore, you might turn them all into sing to, um, for example, if you have two sentences and you want to measure their similarity, if you deem this to be completely different words, uh, you then with certain uh, representations will deem those sentences potentially more different than they are. Um, stemming means that you can strip the suffixes from the end of the word. Um, same idea, you want to have something that make the words look uh, more similar because they are connected. You can break uh, text into individual sentences, which is called sentence segmentation. You might want to decide to remove stop words. Stop words are commonly used words in uh, in a language. For example, in English, these are a, the, is, are. You want to want to remove them because you deem that uh, they occur a lot. So, for example, again, if you want to measure whether two things are similar, they might mo seem more similar than they actually are, just because they have a lot of these commonly used uh, words shared. And you want to focus on those words that are less commonly used that make text uh, more distinct uh, when we compare them. 
Um, and then casing, you might need to just make a decision whether you will lowercase or not. For example, if you have a lot of named entities, the names of people, organization, those are typically uh, come in uppercase and that might be a useful signal. So you might decide, for example, you're working with financial text, you decide, well, I will not actually lowercase my, uh, my uh, text. But if you're working with some very common uh, language, you might decide, well, I don't, I don't need those uh, uppercases that don't give me any signal. And as we moved uh, uh, in this course, uh, we'll see that with pre-trained language models, uh, besides casing, we don't typically do these other steps. So the more powerful our models become, they're less sensitive to these small variations. Uh, then again, remember that I told you that we can't really use pre-trained language models for everything. So these are good techniques to uh, have uh, in mind. And there isn't a standard recipe. Uh, when we talk about machine learning, there will never be a standard recipe for you should use this or that. Uh, these are all modeling decisions that you are going to decide by running many, many experiments, checking your performance and development set, deciding on one set of modeling decisions, and then evaluate on held out test set. All right, so we split our text. Maybe we did some pre-processing. Uh, what now? And the first kind of representation, first feature vector we might use is so-called bag of words. Um, and I'll use iPad to illustrate that because it's easier. Let me just find some sentence I had before. Okay, so here, how do I put this here because of, oh, I don't know how I managed to do that, but looks nice. Let me see. Uh, now I will never be able to re remove it. Um, it's okay. All right. Um, so let me write some sentence here. Um, this is an interesting movie. All right, so here uh, with the bag of words, um, first thing we need is our vocabulary. And vocabulary is going to be um, just a dictionary of the words we have observed in the sentence. And words, because we are splitting with the white space, so tokens and words are all the same to us. So here we would have a word this, and we are gonna index it with zero is, index it with one, n is two. Okay, sorry guys, made a mistake here. Interesting, gonna be three and movie is gonna be four. And then let's say we properly tokenize things and now period is its own word. So we start with this uh, vocabulary. And with bag of words, we are going to have, if this is our X, our F of X is going to be a vector of the dimension. The size of this vector will be the number of words we have in our vocabulary. How many words we have in our vocabulary? Six. So our dimension is going to be uh, also uh, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and each one of these dimensions over here is going to correspond to the word that's indexed with that dimension. So here, dimension zero correspond to token this because this has index zero in the vocabulary. Over here, we have dimension uh, three, which means that we corresponds to the word that has index three in our vocabulary, which is interesting. And now we need to fill the values of this vector. The values are going to be one or zero if we are going to record presence of uh, this corresponding word in our input string. Another option is to have count of the words. So let's stick with the uh, presence. Um, here, every single word 
had appeared, right? Because our vocabulary consists exactly of all the words uh, in this input sequence. So we here, we would have ones for all of them. Um, and let's say you now have another sentence. I, I don't know, bad movie. You can then extend your vocabulary to have uh, another word, bad, and you would index it with six. And here the final dimension would be, um, we would have a new dimension in this vector and what would be the value we would place in this place over here? Zero, right? Because we are measuring the presence of absence of the of the word. So here in this last dimension over here, we have, uh, it corresponds to the word bad. The word bad did not appear in the sequence, this is an interesting movie, and therefore it gets zero. Um, let's say we have a Z, very, very bad movie. Um, something like this. Here we would have, we have now a word very, and comma. And if we make a representation of Z, it's also going to have one, two, three. Now we added two more. So here we have zero and zero. All right, let's try to make a feature vector for Z together. Um, and instead of the presence of absence, like here, presence, Let's uh, let's uh, record count of the token, uh, corresponding token. So how many times token had appeared in the input sequence? So let's start with the first dimension, what we will have in the first dimension. Zero. Then next, zero. Next. Okay, you need to be louder. Interesting, so zero. Next one, one, because movie appears here. Um, next, zero, period doesn't appear. Next one, one, uh, two. Uh, so we have next one is very, and very appears twice. And now we switch from recording presence or absence to count. So here we have two, and uh, finally, um, we have, um, I feel like I didn't record the dimensions well, so. Um, well, just a moment. So this is an interesting movie period. Bad appears once very appears twice and then finally we have period which then is one okay so you have these two options the principle is the same you have your vocabulary as you have seen now we have did this on the fly we had these two sentences and then we were extending the vocabulary and extending the um feature vectors a more reasonable thing we usually do is we have a collection of our texts already that don't come really on fly, at least in NLP. So first you produce your vocabulary by finding all the um, unique words or tokens you have, and then you index them and your feature vector will be of the size of the vocabulary. And then you're gonna record either presence or absence or count. Again, there is no standard recipe. You can choose either one of these things. Um, so yeah, going back to the question, what are the features? Features here would be, uh, be um, it, it's a, it's, I would say that they are referred to um, in a little bit vague way in our community. I think people would say both that words are featured here, but they will also say that the uh, these quantities, presence or absence or count of the word is the feature. So. It's a little bit uh, vague. I, I would say more precise is to say that feature is present absence of the word because you've produced a feature vector by concatenating features. 
but you will hear uh, either of these two things. Okay, uh, just going back to the questions we had before, is this now a little bit clearer? Okay. Um, all right, let me speed up a little bit. So uh, this is one option. The other option is a bag of engrams. Uh, engram is a sequence of uh, n tokens. Again, here we are wor working with words. Our tokens are the same thing as words right now. They're not always going to be. And uh, so if the we have a sequence of n words, let's say we have sequence of two words. Um, two words, so let's say we are looking into two grams, then these two grams would be, uh, this is, what's the next two gram? Is N, yep. Next one, and interesting, and then we have interesting movie. Um, movie, movie period. Um, why this might be useful? Well, for example, we have these um, negations here. This is uh, not necessarily here, but um, imagine this is not, uh, n not great or something like that. That combination of words together tells you bad sentiment. But if you look at them independently, then you lost that this is a negative sentiment and you might think, because you have observed just word good or great uh, without negation that the sentiment is actually positive. So having two grams might be a more powerful way to approach your uh, uh, problem. And the procedure is the same then, except having these independent words here in your vocabulary, you will have these phrases that consist of two words. So you would have uh, this is, and you will index it with one, is an, index it with one, and interesting, index two, interesting movie period uh, would be get the index three. And again, you produce the same kind of feature vector of the size of the number of phrases or two grams you have. You place zero, one, depending on whether that two gram appeared or not in your input. Um, here in the slide, I skipped over that, but I, I didn't mention it. Um, this word corpus or corpora is also very important. I will just finish this thought and then come to you. Um, we refer this to say, this is a collection of um, computer readable texts um, or speech. So it's not very, I don't know, it's, um, you might be using, call, sometimes using word data to describe this, but if you hear corpora or corpus, it usually means that's unlabeled. I think that's what, what people want to specify. It's just large collection of text. There is no human notation over it. Uh, yeah. Two questions. Mm -hmm. One is how is the vocabulary related to the corpus? Is it the same? Or, and the second question is mm -hmm. uh, about the epigraphs. So, for example, if we form two graphs, uh, can you also use them to associate adjectives? Like, for example, if a reader says uh, good, mm -hmm. and the reader says very good, mm -hmm. can we say that the one that has very good is a more positive use in the text? These are great questions. So the first question is the difference between a corpus and, um, sorry, remind me, yeah. vocabulary. Yeah, so corpus is just a collection of texts. And imagine uh, Wikipedia. If we scrape Wikipedia, we would get a corpus of Wikipedia. Uh, and you will have a sequences of, you know, coherent words there, right? Vocabulary would look into this corpus and collect uh, information about which unique words or tokens appeared in this collection and index them. So it is just the dictionary of unique uh, tokens, words that have appeared in the corpus. So in this case, can we say that the entire set of movie reviews that we have is kind of our topic? Exactly, yeah. And, and now just going back to this difference between corpus and data, because usually we would, when we scrape, I don't know, IMDB, we have a application in mind. So we'll do sentiment classification, then we'll pick the labeled as well. And then when we have a labeled collection of data, then we would say data set rather than corpus. 
I don't know why is this difference really important, um, but you would never use corpus to describe the label data set. Um, this is just a communication norm in the community. I don't think it's anything more than just that. So yeah, if you had a bunch of you know reviews like this, without the labels, that would be corpus. When you have labels, data set, and this is the vocabulary. Um, yeah. Um, and finally, there is also TF IDF that you might have heard uh, from before. Um, let me now try to kill my. This one. Mm -mm. Has anyone ever did this intentionally? Because oh, okay. I see. All right. Uh, because of Zoom, that's how I record the lectures. I need everything to be, I think, on the same display. And because I have gazillion of these, I have gazillion of tabs. Okay. I think we'll prevent that from happening again. Okay, uh, so the final representation, and I will go very quickly over it, is TF-IDF. Um, again, uh, here you are going to measure the uh, frequency. Oh, let me hide this. Okay. All right, so um, term frequency will be just a count. I always found it a little bit confusing. We called count frequency. I think for me, frequency would be normalized by the number of um, words that appear, but uh, that's a side point. So you have term frequency, um, for example, in a in document here would be a sentiment review or Wikipedia article or a play, whatever is the one, like a piece of uh, document you have. And you measure how many times the a uh, word or token appears there. Uh, but with TF, TF IDF, you are also considering the fact that um, if a word appears in only a single document you have uh, relative to other documents you have in your collection, that word is kind of special for this document and you wanna give it more attention relative to the other ones. So here you would use inverse doc document fre frequency, which is uh, a fraction. It's uh, N is the number of documents you have over document frequency of the term, which is the count of documents, the number of documents where this term appears in. So if this um, term appears only in a single document, the inverse document frequency will be the highest it can be. If the word appears in every single document, like stop word, is going to only get the inverse uh, document frequency of one. And you're going to then multiply to your uh, term, uh, term frequency with your inverse uh, uh, document frequency. So you are kind of considering both of these things uh, to, together. And again, uh, you will then uh, produce uh, a vector out of it. I'm mentioning it briefly you because you will see it, especially if you do more data science kind of things. Uh, however, on January 22nd, we will learn about token embeddings and there, these are gonna be a more powerful representation of our tokens. And I think even in uh, very, very standard applications, we are still gonna end up using word embeddings, although we might not use neural network on top of it. Uh, we are still gonna start with these more powerful representations. So it's good to know about this, but I, I suspect you'll all be using word embeddings uh, uh, forever for whatever you are doing later on. Okay, so we have covered how to go from our string into uh, a vector representation of that uh, string, right? Um, uh, with these uh, procedures we have gone over. And now we are ready to, uh, put that vector into a model and try to get the prediction out of it. So we are going to start with uh, perceptron, then we're gonna move into logistic regression. This will be two examples of how, of these functions M that we wanna learn. And, um, and we are going to talk about optimization algorithm for learning their parameters. And with all of this, uh, when we cover that, you have learned one machine learning algorithm and the basics of this, you know, how to go from this string, which is kind of um, not really easy to manipulate computationally into something you can computationally manipulate like a vector and then into a final uh, prediction. Okay, um, so 
we are going to start with a more like a, our setup. This is going to be a setup, and that's binary linear classification. Um, and this is the, I would say, the easiest way to get a prediction out of your feature vector. Here you have some, um, you have your feature vector. Let's say we had 10 words in our vocabulary. Therefore, this is a 10 dimensional vector where each dimension is presence or absence of the word in the vocabulary. And then we have a weight vector. Uh, this is a vector where we place the coefficient. Um, I have mentioned before, um, I will need that. So let's say if we have a line, uh, a line can be written as uh, W0 plus W1X. These are parameters. Previously, I have written A plus BX, which is, you know, you have seen this even in high school, right? A plus B uh, X, but to kind of keep the notation uh, similar to what we are using now, we will write the line as W0 plus W1 uh, X. And then our weight vector here is going to be W0, W1. Um, if you are paying attention really, really, really closely, you might call me out for how it's possible that the uh, on the slide, the weight vector and the uh, feature vector are the same dimensional. Uh, now I have here in this example, we have only a single dimension, x, but we have two dimensions for our weight vector. Um, the reason is because we are going to fold this bias term this is the bias term. It's called bias term officially. Um, we, are gonna, uh, we are going to represent our feature vector in a way that allows us to not constantly write this bias term. So what I mean is if you have your f of x is going to be here 1, we are going to place that 1, a dummy variable, and then our representation of uh, f. Uh, of uh, x. I will give it tilde just because I don't like to call uh, two different things the same way. Um, so now when you have w transpose times f of x, these are two vectors and we are doing the dot product. Then definition of dot product says it's literally i equals to one to whatever is dimension. Dimension is two here of wi times f x i, which is when we uh, plug everything in, it's a w zero times f x uh, zero, which is one plus w one f x one, um, which is, yeah. All right, so uh, they are the same dimensional, but we are assuming we are adding these uh, dummy variables uh, here, this dummy variable one here, and then we don't need to uh, uh, kind of uh, drag this bias term. Our notation becomes slightly simple. To write the linear model, all we need to do is this. We write a dot product between a weight vector and our feature representation. Okay, so... Going back to the uh, classification model, with the binary linear classification, assuming we have found appropriate weights in our weight vector, what we are going to do is decide that the label is going to be positive plus one when this dot product is larger than zero. And this probably doesn't mean anything to you if you don't see the intuition behind this. And the intuition is that you have these two classes, positive and negative, and they are linearly separable. Okay, uh, we are assuming they are linearly separable, and that we can use a linear classifiers. On one side, uh, we'll have one class; on the other, we'll have the other class. And uh, our weight vector is actually also a vector in this same space. And uh, it points to the direction of our positive class. So when you make a dot product between your feature vector and that weight vector, if, uh, uh, if your example belongs to the positive class, it's going to point in the direction 
uh, in the same direction as the weight vector, which is captured by the dot product being positive. And then if the dot product is negative, that means that your feature belongs to the class that is in directions uh, that's separate of the direction of the weight vector, which is captured by the dot product being uh, negative. So that's all there is uh, to it. It's about uh, weight vector being in the space, making a dot product moving in the direction of the uh, weight vector where the positive class is uh, and uh, in the separate direction if uh, the dot product is negative, meaning that uh, the direction is opposite of the weight vector. And now we're going to see the first um, model we are going to use and um, and um, how to find these weights because here I have told you what the rule is to make a decision, but I didn't tell you how you're gonna find these weights, right? So I just I just put them there. So now let's see one algorithm, the perceptron algorithm, that will also give us how to uh, find these weights uh, double. And in the first step, we are going to we are going to find them iteratively. So we are going to initialize our um, um, weight vectors W. For example, you can place them to be zero. And we are going to do, as I said, this iteratively uh, with some number of uh, iterations. Again, there is a magical number here. You might have also some other criteria if you see that um, something good is happening, for example. Uh, usually you just know from other people what these numbers should be set to approximately. And then for every examples in your data set, uh, you are going to decide that the prediction is going to be plus one if the dot product between the current weight vector and the feature vector for that example is uh, positive and is going to be minus one otherwise. You make that decision. And then uh, if you made a good prediction, that's great. You don't need have a reason to update your weight uh, vector, right? Why would you change it if you are getting good predictions? But if not, if your true label I, I is different from I hat, which is the predicted label, then you are going to update the weight. This is the formula for how you are going to update it. Uh, and the intuition is if you had um, predicted, that the label is positive and it should be negative, then you are change, going to change the weight vector such that the, the new weight vector and the dot product with the feature vector of that example is smaller because you're trying to get negative dot product, which would determine that this label is gonna be negative, which it is. Separate from that uh, is that your example is maybe positive and you have decided that it's negative. Uh, for this example to be labeled positive, what you need is dot product to be positive. So you are gonna make the update of your weight such that the scalar product, the dot product between the weights and the feature vector is bigger. And this is captured by these equations that look stupid when we looked at them just like this. Uh, basically, you are increasing your weight vectors uh, by the value of some uh, lambda times um, uh, f of x of i. And this lambda is what we call a hyperparameter. It's a, it's, a, it's a value of that you need to set to something. There isn't a magical number, but it determines the whole uh, procedure of your algorithm. Hyperparameters are chosen such that you pick few values, you see your performance on the development set, you determine, uh-huh, one of these is great, 0.1 weighs better than the others, I'm gonna use this one. And then with that value, you evaluate on the held out test set. You never use, um, you never choose the value of your hyperparameters by your performance on the held out test set. That would be cheating because then we don't know whether that value of that hyperparameter will work generalized for new unseen instances, which is the key thing we want with machine learning. Um, okay, so may let's maybe work out uh, through a few examples. Um, let me see here. A 
Okay. Okay, I started to, um, I prepared uh, something a little bit. You need to shout at me whenever I'm not sharing you this uh, screen because I will start writing on iPad and after five minutes, someone will say, we don't see what you're writing and I would rather that you immediately tell me when you don't see it. Um, okay, so um, let me just show you what I have here. Uh, we have here a few examples movie good, movie bad, not good. So obviously I removed stop words here. Um, and we are having our vocabulary that consists of words, movie, good, bad, not, index from one to three. So the first uh, feature vector will be one, one, zero, zero because movie and good appear and uh, the other ones do not appear. Uh, let's quickly work out um, through other feature vectors. So what's the feature vector for movie bad? Just tell me sequence of numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, can someone raise the hand and you, you started to speak, right? Someone there, okay. One, zero, one, zero, great. And maybe someone else, maybe someone on that side for not good, yeah. Zero, one, zero, one. Zero, one, zero. One, that's right. All right. So with uh, our decision, we are having binary classifier, right? It's gonna be determined by the uh, v, uh, w uh, transpose times x. So the pro dot product between the weight vector and the uh, feature vector. And to be consistent with the notation, let me just change a few things over here. We call this f of x, right? And this is gonna be, W T F of X. Okay, so um, these are very simple dot products. So uh, can you mentally compute what's the dot product between the zero uh, vector? Uh, actually, no. Uh, so, excuse me, I need to start over. Um, the We are gonna set our weight vector to be all zeros. So dot product between this vector and a vector of all zeros, obviously zero, always zero, which means that our decision will be that this is a negative review. Movie good is what kind of review? Positive. So here we made a mistake, right? Um, now I wish I, I do have that split thing. Um, I don't know how to make it. Um, all right, just I just want to remind you of the rule. So when we make the wrong decision, what we are doing is updating W by lambda times um, uh, feature vector. Okay, we either add lambda times feature vector or, or we subtract it. Um, so here, over here. This is our Lambda times f of x. Lambda is uh, one. Oh, you didn't shout immediately. <laughs> By the end of this course, you're just gonna shout at me. Uh, so lambda is one. So here we are, because we made the wrong uh, prediction, we are making this update where we uh, add to our current weight vector, uh, lambda times feature vector. So this is the feature vector and one corresponds to lambda. And now our weight uh, vector is, um, is uh, we have a new weight vector. So here, weight, and this is the new weight vector. All right. So now you will help me. Um, this is our feature vector for the second example. And this is our new, uh, new uh, weight vector. What's the dot product between these two? Yeah, that's because of the thing I have said before. We fold it into the feature uh, representation. Um, oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah. Um, let's say we just ignore bias term. We decided bias term was going to be zero. Officially, you will have, you know, you will have extended by one, as you said, and you will have uh, the weight vector being larger than four. But for, yeah, let's just ignore it to not recompute everything here. 
Um, okay, so we have the weight vector here and we have the feature vector here. What's the dot product between these two things? One. Okay, and what's the decision for this? That's gonna be positive, right? Because the dot product is positive, we decide that this is gonna have label plus one. And is this good? No, it's not because movie bad, it's a negative uh, sentiment, so we should have minus one. So now uh, we are going to update our um, weight vector. Uh, excuse me. Because this should be negative, here we have minus lambda, so minus one times 1010, oh, oh, which is then one minus one is zero. Zero, one minus zero is one. Zero minus uh, one is minus one, and zero minus uh, zero is uh, zero. All right. Now, what's the dot product here? One. Let me just quickly check. Uh, yes, it's one. So decision is going to be positive. And is this good? It's not good, right? Uh, so again, we need to update our vector, zero, minus one, zero. It should be negative, so minus lambda, and then zero, one, zero, one, uh, and then we'll get something. And this will be our epoch one. We have gone over all of our example. So here, this, all of this is epoch one. And we would go to the epoch two, and we won't do that now, but if we would now uh, calculate this again, we would see that again for the first example, uh, we are making a bad uh, decision, and then we keep, would keep going and going. But actually here, um, we, would co we would continue this infinitely and still not find very good uh, uh, weight vectors. And um, I can illustrate why this is the case quickly with uh, this uh, example. So here we have good, bad, and not our, 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 our uh, words. So we have here one, zero, 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 one, uh, zero, nope, one, zero, one, and uh, zero, one, one. This is our feature vector, um, I'll just, I want that brackets for to go quicker. And uh, so we have this three dimensional space here. And um, the first one is gonna be here, right? This is gonna be good. And good has positive uh, label. Then bad, we have zero here, one here, zero in the third axis here, we'll have zero. Not good, it's one zero one so here minus and here we have uh one one not bad positive do you see what the issue is here it's a it's a hard question because it's not obvious but if i tell you that we are working with linear classifiers it might be do exactly uh, we are, as I said, we make assumptions. One assumption we made is that our problem is linearly separable, separable, ugh, whatever, uh, but it's not. And our perceptron actually uh, will work only if uh, we have a representation of our inputs that are linearly separable. And actually you could make this instances more separated uh, linearly if you use two grams. So if I had um, used uh, added uh, not good here as, as, a, as a thing in a not bad in my vocabulary, I would extend the feature vector of these uh, uh, examples here and this would look different and perceptron would work. So one point here I'm trying to make is that perceptron will never necessarily always work for your problems. Uh, and linear binary classification in general, uh, but with a good choice of features and uh, feature vector, you may 
make the space better and therefore perceptron will work uh, better. Yeah. I'm wondering what if I are more than two simple forms? Yeah, exactly. So if you are trying to um, solve um, solve non-linear problems with linear models, you are using two simple models for your problem. Uh, but have in mind what I just said that your um, representation of your space will also change depending on what you use as your features. So if you have really good features in a very high dimensional space, these things become uh, more separable. So um, also have, have that in mind. Yeah. Will you go back to the example one, please? Yeah. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the lambda at the beginning of one, but at, in the second and third, like for me, bad and not good becomes negative one. Something. Why is it negative? Yeah, it's um because of the formula in the algorithm. So here, uh, you will have update. Uh, you will update with um plus lambda f uh, of x. If uh you should have if you have a gold label positive, but if the gold label is negative, you are gonna uh re you know, subtract uh, lambda f uh, from uh, weights. And remember, this is to achieve the, um, what I said, you want to increase or decrease dot product because if you're, if you want to have negative prediction, the dot product should be negative. So you are trying to decrease, then you change the weight vector such that the dot product is smaller. And then eventually it might become negative and that's what you want for that example. Okay. Um... Can we explain one more time uh, what an epoch is? Did you say that was like yeah. one epoch and then like how many times did we do this? Yeah, so epoch generally means that you have gone over your entire training data set. Uh, people will sometimes confuse epoch with steps and iteration and gradient um, extent. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, so here, epoch means we have gone over all of our examples, which are only three here. There is a magical number for the number of epochs. It's a hyperparameter we set, uh, and people have, for different algorithms, different suggestions of which number of epochs you should use. Yeah. And if you have converged and you are in doing well, you won't uh, break your model. It's just You're just going to waste those computation. Uh, but here with perceptron, you might not even waste them because um, if everything is fine, you just don't do anything. So you are just having this for loop that doesn't do anything. It just goes over the examples and wastes a little bit of time. Yeah. Okay. So um, what I said here um, about this separability and everything, uh, there are two theorems. We are not gonna go over these theorems. Uh, if you have taken machine learning, uh, of course, you already know about them. If you are taking it now, we will learn about this later in the semester. But basically, uh, when we have a separability, linear separability, then the perceptron will converge and we have that that's proven by the convergence theorem. But if we do not have this linear separability, we'll just keep doing this and we'll never find optimal uh, solution for our uh, problem. If you are really eager to learn the proofs and you can't really wait, I recommend that you check the uh, Professor Vivek Srikumar's lecture on this where he goes uh, over the proof uh, um, um, in detail. Okay, so I need to go back because I was too eager for you to learn uh, feature re uh, feature vectors that I skipped one part. And that part is our optimization algorithm, uh, which is here. So we have seen one way to change our update, our weights to uh, find a solution uh, to, you know, to learn our model. Uh, a more common, uh, way to go about finding our optimal ways is through optimization using our numerical optimization algorithm, such as stochastic gradient descent. Here, you have to have a notion of the loss. Loss I described before as the difference between our predicted and actual values. And if you have that, then you are what you're trying to do is you're trying to find weights that, optim that minimize the loss. Ideally, you would have a loss of zero. So if you have a, this nice convex function over here, 
uh, you might achieve a loss of uh, zero. Something with neural networks, especially big and large ones, will almost never achieve because they are not convex. I mean, loss functions are not convex. Um, and the idea between behind gradient descent is that you are going to try to make small steps that bring you to the bottom of this uh, valley where the minimum is. Um, if you remember your calculus class, you might remember that the, the gradient of your function or derivative of your function, but depending on whether you work with one or more variables, will point you to the direction of the uh, where where uh, there is a steepest descent, right? Remember, you will make the line here, and then the gradient points to that uh, direction. So it's the direction of the steepest uh, descent. If you take the negative gradient, and then if you had uh, like opposite version of this, you will uh, the the derivative will point you to the maximum. Um, so with gradient descent is super simple. You initialize your parameters. You choose a hyperparameter called a learning rate. I'll come to learning rate in a second. You again iterate, no magical number of iteration. And you are going to shuffle your training data, and then you are going to pick one uh, of your examples. Um, we don't. I'm shuffling data here because you need to pick your example randomly. So you can either shuffle the data first and then take the examples in order, or you can fix the order and then randomly sample. It it's, doesn't matter, but it has to be stochastic. That's where the stochastic part comes from. And you're going to compute the gradient of your loss function. And then you are going to change the weights such that you moved in this direction of the steepest descent. And how much you move is determined by this uh, lambda over here. Um, if we had the positive sign, we wouldn't move downwards, we would move upwards. So that's where the negative signs comes from. Um, and this is described in this previous slide nicely. Um, when you have appropriate uh, uh, step size, learning rate, then you will make these nice little hops. But if you take a huge learning rate, then these um, steps are gonna be enormous. So here you will go instead of little bit, if you take huge learning rate, it will go all over there. Not something we want. We want to go to the, to the bottom of this. So the choice of the learning rate uh, is important. Um, also, this is a perfect world where we would uh, be patient and wait for um, to go over all of our data to make these updates. Gradient computations are expensive. Gradient um, with respect to the, the weights uh, is going to be vector of the size of the number of weights. Today, large language models of, are of the size of 100 billion parameters. So you are computing a vector of hundreds of billion of parameters. And that's a computationally intensive operation. So you don't want to do that all the time. So instead what we do, we sample a batch of data and then we compute the gradients um, uh, for these examples. And then we change the weights uh, using the average gradient of those examples um, after we have seen all these examples in this batch. So if the batch size is 64, we make the update after uh, based on the gradients of these 64 examples, not after every single one of them. So you are making the updates less frequently, uh, which is makes the gradients noisier, uh, but uh, it makes everything uh, faster. And this is called mini batch gradient descent. And yeah, this won't work super nicely if you have certain situations. So for example, here, if you start over here, you initialize your weights over here, you will end up with what we call local minima. If you have a saddle point as well, uh, here the gradients will become zero, you will not make any further updates. And that's why there are many more alternatives to stochastic gradients, uh, gradient descent that we use actually in practice like Adam, Adagrad, and so on that we'll uh, mention later on. So stochastic gradient descent is your most important tool in your toolkit when you work with machine learning and deep learning. And 
instead of using the updates I have shown you before, if you define a loss function like this uh, and use stochastic gradient descent, you will get the same uh, uh, kind of um, same perceptron we have seen uh, before. So that's good to know because it's always going to be the easiest thing to use to have a gradient the set. It's part of all of our toolkits. It's at some point when you hear it a gazillion times, it will be that technique that's the most intuitive and easiest to use. So the fact that we can define the loss and use SGD to produce perceptron is great. Okay, and now I wanna quickly go over logistic regression and then when we meet uh, in, uh, so on Monday is MLK day and therefore we will, uh, it's a holiday. We will not have a lecture. We'll meet next time in seven day on Wednesday. I will go a little bit slower over this, but I do want to go over this uh, to for your assignments. So logistic regression is our alternative to perceptron and it's foundation for many techniques in this course, including uh, neural networks. It's a discriminative probabilistic model, which means that we are going to uh, predict the uh, probability, the likelihood of the label given our input, instead of uh, trying to compute the joint distribution of the label and the input, which uh, these would be the class of models we call generating models, something that's connected to autoregressive models and our pre-trained language models later on. And logistic regression will assign a positive label using this uh, this equation here, which looks very scary. Again, we have that dot product in uh, subscripts here. And um, maybe you remember uh, this form of a function from somewhere before, but this is the uh, form of a logistic regression where X here is this dot products we have seen before. And logistic function has this kind of shape where in these extremes for very small values and very large values is going to be minus one or one. And when we have zero, it's gonna be 0 0.5. Importantly, it's never gonna be, um, excuse me, I said, uh, I said something wrong here. It's going to be um, um, zero, not, uh, not minus one. Uh, so it it is bounded by zero and one, and therefore it has this, almost like a probabil probability uh, notion, although it's not exactly probability. I will touch on that at some point uh, later on. And um, you can compute the probability of other label by taking one minus uh, this, uh, this um, quantity here, and you would get uh, this formula. Um, and how is decision make? His decision is actually uh, very, uh, it's the same as the decision we had before. Before we had a decision, if dot product is larger than zero, we'll have a label plus one. Uh, but, and here that corresponds to, because uh, our dot product is over here, and that's what's on X, X axis over here. If your dot product is, uh, li larger than zero, then your probability is gonna be uh, larger than half. And therefore, if the probability of that class is larger than half, that means we should predict that class because we have only two options. So the probability of the other class will be lower than half. Um, okay, let me see. All right. Uh, okay, so, I will then go over the logistic regression uh, next time we meet. I don't think it, uh, I mean, we don't have time anymore, but I do need to see how that uh, will affect your assignment. So I'll keep you posted about that. You can start with the perceptron. That's your first part of assignment. And then uh, the logistic regression is the next one. I just want to check that you have enough time uh, for everything. Okay, have a nice uh, longer weekend, y'all. And watch out for the snow.